Hello everyone. Welcome to the Plex webinar on introduction to physical domains. I'm Manu Parimi. I'm an applications engineer here at Plexim. And joining me today in the webinar is another applications engineer, Nicholas Felderer. Hello everybody. Today we both are going to discuss about um, thermal, magnetic, and mechanical domains in Plex. If you have any questions during our presentation, please enter them in the questions window on the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll try our best to answer them after the presentation or during. If we cannot get back to you, we'll get back to you by email. You could also email us at info at plexim.com. So let's begin with a brief introduction about our company and who we are. We are originally a Swiss company. We started in 2002 with Plex. And more recently, we have developed uh, the RT box, which is our real-time platform or the hardware in the loop platform. We have offices in Zurich in Switzerland. And in the US, we have offices in the Boston area in Massachusetts and Seattle in Washington. So we have many customers, uh, both in universities as well as in industries. This is just like a brief introduction. Let, let's continue with the tools that we're going to see today which are the Plex standalone and the thermal domain, magnetic domain, and mechanical domains. So what is Plex? Plex is a system level simulation tool for power electronic system. Here, uh, what you're seeing is a double fed induction generator or DFIG. I have taken this uh, from one of our demo models available in the Plex library. So this example uh, shows here, there is a stator which is connected uh, to the grid through a transformer. And then on the rotor side, it is connected to the back-to-back -back converter via slip rings. And the grid side connector is con connected to the tertiary winding of this transformer. So what we are seeing here is an interaction between all the different domains of Plex so all domains of Plex are color coded, by the way. So the black lines that you're seeing here is the electrical domain. The purple that you're seeing here is the mechanic, mechanical domain. The turbine model has been um, built in the mechanical domain. And the brown that you're seeing here is the magnetic domain. The green is the controls. And the blue here is the thermal domain. Now, this slide is important because it shows the basic idea of Plex. What we don't have in Plex is a detailed physical behavior, behavioral model of the semiconductor switches. The way you're seeing on the left is it shows the uh, transients of voltage and current. This needs a very detailed model with very different time constants inside. This would need uh, us to do very small steps to integrate this would become very costly. Now imagine if you have a very complex power electronic converter like the DFIG model I showed earlier, then you'd have to wait forever if you want to simulate the behavior at every switching instant. This is not the idea of Plex. What we do instead is what you see on the right, we idealize the behavior of the switch, meaning that internally we use ideal switches. So we either have voltage or current but there's nothing in between. This approach makes it possible to simulate exceptionally big circuits uh, in affordable time. This is the general idea of our system level simulation. So this is another interesting slide because this shows how Plex works in general. So in, in a power electronic system, normally if we have, let's say, n number of switches, then we have two to the power of n possible switching combinations. For example, in this particular uh, case of a buck converter, we have two switches, right? There is a MOSFET or an IGBT here, and there's a diode. So we'd have four possible combinations. Normally, Plex tosses out the combinations that are physically impossible. So in this case, this MOSFET and this diode cannot be turned on at the same time. So in this case, we are left with two combinations. Then Plex calculates a set of differential, differential equations describing the behavior of each switching case. In this case, when the uh, MOSFET is on and the diode is off, and when the switch or the MOSFET is off and the diode is on, these two are the switching states here, 
So what this means is that each switching state is described with a certain linear state space matrix. So during the simulation, Plex detects which state is actually active and uses the corresponding set of differential equations like shown here for numerical integration. Another way of looking at it is that we are completely now removing the switch and we are only dealing with states. So now let's start uh, with the thermal domain. The major question here in the thermal domain is that like I mentioned earlier, we are not dealing with the transients of voltage and current signals. Now, how is it possible to get the switching losses? Because we cannot now just multiply the two signals and perform a time-based integration over it. So what we do instead is for every switching component, for example, here a MOSFET or a diode, you can put in a thermal description behind it, the way you're seeing it on the right. In this case, what you can do is you can enter lookup tables for losses. How we do it, uh, I'll, sh I'll show it in a minute, but uh, this is what we do. We describe a 3D table which has losses, loss information here. This can be generated out of a data sheet or a detailed physical behavior model tool or measurements. So during the simulation, what would happen is now the electrical circuit supplies the blocking voltages and the conduction currents and the thermal domain supplies the junction temperature. Now based on these three values, Plex goes into this lookup table and calculates the appropriate loss value which is dissipated as an energy packet at a switching event like you're seeing here. So this describes uh, a simulation of an electrical thermal model in the sense like I mentioned earlier again, the electrical, this is the electrical circuit which supplies the conduction currents and the blocking voltages. This is the thermal circuit which supplies the temperature and we have the lookup table that's giving the loss information. So all domains in Plex are analogous to an electrical circuit. Similarly, a thermal domain is also analogous to an electrical circuit. In this case, what we are seeing here is that the voltage in the electrical domain is temperature in the thermal domain and the charge is heat and current is heat flow and electrical capacitance and electrical resistances are thermal capacitance and thermal resistances in the thermal domain. Let's now continue with the magnetic domain. I'll come back uh, and show you an example of the thermal domain uh, on Plex in a minute. Now the idea of magnetic domain is to model magnetic components within your converter based on the geometry of the device instead of relying on the inductance matrices. So there are several ways to model uh, these magnetic circuits. In Plex, however, we use the Permian's capacitance analogy, which means that the core elements are uh, modeled using permeances, which in the electrical circuit corresponds to a capacitor, and the losses are uh, modeled by using resistors, which in the electrical circuit corresponds to resistors. It makes a lot of sense to represent uh, the core elements with capacitor because a capacitor normally in the electrical circuit stores energy, right? It doesn't dissipate energy. So while the resistor is a lossy element, now the neat thing about this approach is that it is very intuitive to see the magnetic flux path here. Now what we're seeing here is the transformer on the left and then the same transformer is built on the right in the magnetic domain. So the magnetic domain makes the modeling of your transformers or your inductors very intuitive because you're now thinking in terms of turn numbers lengths of flux paths, cross section of flux paths, and you retain now the geometrical relationship, thus being able to probe any of the legs. So we can now delve into Plex to see some examples. Uh, 
what you're seeing here is the Plex world. This is what uh, Plex world would look like with the yellow background to do your schematics. There is a library here, a library browser here organized um, according to the domains. And then if you want to see the several of the demo models that we have, you can go to window, demo models. And here we have all the demo models available again categorized according to um, the types. Or so coming back to this circuit, here this is just an example uh, of two transformers, delta YY transformers in both electrical and magnetic domains. So if I open up the electrical domain and also the magnetic domain here, so here on the electrical domain you can see that this is a very huge transformer and then we have to think in terms of inductances and matrices here. The same transformer can be modeled in the magnetic domain where we have three legs. This is a delta leg, this is a Y leg and this is also a Y leg. Now here we saturate the windings on each leg and interconnect them to the electrical domain. So this is much more intuitive than doing it in the sorry, much more intuitive in doing it in the magnetic domain than in the electrical domain here. So now we can just start with building a thermal domain. Um, so let me close that. So this is a simple buck converter. We can build a thermal domain around it now. So what you see here is just a therm uh, just a buck converter with uh, input of 500 volts and the duty ratio that we are providing uh, is 0.5. So the output should be 250 volts. And here we have a diode and a MOSFET. And let's build a thermal domain around this MOSFET. So to do that, let's open the thermal library. What you see here are all the components available uh, in the thermal domain. Let's drag and drop the heat sink onto the MOSFET block. So we talked about calculating the thermal losses earlier, uh, which, are, which are the switching and connection losses of your switch, for example, here your MOSFET. But the other part of the thermal domain is how we model the thermal impedances. For example, this is your junction. You would have to model your thermal impedances from junction to ambient, right? So what we could do is we could have a thermal junction of your component to case or case your actual heat sink or heat sink to ambient by using a thermal chain here. So a thermal chain would have, let me drag and drop and show. So a thermal chain would have uh, thermal resistances and thermal capacitances and then you can model using that or you could just model using the thermal resistances or thermal capacitors, for example. Now heat sink component is important because this, this component is the one that links the electrical domain to the thermal domain. By the way, you can change the terminal here uh, by holding shift and then moving um, your cursor. So if I double click on the heat sink, you will see that the, you, there is a way to change the number of terminals and then there's a way to add thermal capacitances and all that. So like, I'm, like I was saying, heat sink component is the one that links the electrical domain to the thermal domain. But heat sink itself is a confusing term because you can think of this as a surface of uniform temperature. This absorbs all the losses of the components and anything sitting on the heat sink, for example, this MOSFET will have the same temperature um, as the heat sink essentially. So you can just think of it as a surface of uniform temperature and not a heat sink. So for now, let's just um, add a thermal resistor. So thermal resistor in the thermal circuit is an e equivalent to a electrical resistor in the sense that if you put an electrical resistor, then there is a difference in voltage in between the two nodes. In case of a thermal resistor, there's a difference in temperature between the two nodes. So let's add, let's connect the thermal resistor to the ambient temperature. So this is your ambient temperature here. 
if I double click on this constant temperature block, in this case it's ambient temperature, and I can enter, let's say, 25. So the temperature here that I entered is actually a difference between two surfaces. So it does not matter if you give this value in degrees or degrees Celsius or Kelvin, since it's essentially a temperature difference and not an absolute value of temperature itself. Um, let's check that box. Um, let's give the therm let's keep the thermal resistance as one, or we could give 0.5. So now um, we here have a thermal circuit. Now what we need to do is we need to mention the thermal loss values to this MOSFET. So what you would do is go to thermal and then you add a thermal description here. You could do that in two ways. You could add your thermal description from the library or you could enter a new thermal description. So when you enter a new thermal description, there is a way, uh, there is a, a table here for you to mention your turn on losses and turn off losses and conduction losses, for example. And you can enter the name of the manufacturer and the part number. Usually you would get this out of your data sheet. But recently we have partnered uh, with some manufacturers such as Wolfspeed, ABB, and Infineon, from whom you can download a readily built dot xml file which provides all the thermal information here so that you don't have to do it yourself that would provide uh, plex ready values for you i did that uh, and i got a thermal description file from wolf speed which i have here so if you see this has changed a bit to the custom value i'll talk about that in a second now if I go to edit, you can see the uh, thermal description or the loss values that Wolfspeed has provided. So if you see here, this is the manufacturer, the part number, and the type that we're using is the MOSFET. So what you're seeing here is that there are many different ways to enter the loss values. One is a lookup table approach, and one is a formula approach, or you can do both combined as uh, Wolfspeed did here. So these values are the variables which are getting which we are getting from uh, the uh, from the electrical and the thermal circuits for example vi we are getting from the electrical which are the blocking voltages and the conduction currents and t is the temperature which we are getting from the heatsink and now e is the energy and rg here uh, is a variable, a custom variable, which Wolfspeed has created, which is the external gate resistance that we saw um, on the window outside also. So similarly, we have turn off losses, and then we have conduction losses. This is when the device is conducting. So this is a 3D table, which you can look up using the values here. Now the thermal impedance. Thermal impedance is the same as, let's go here. So like I mentioned, there is a way for you to mention the uh, thermal chain or a thermal network here using the thermal uh, resistors or capacitors or the thermal chain. You could have your uh, thermal impedances here or you could combine them all and put them here. So this is, this is all the same thing. But the difference between uh, adding them here and here is that there is a way for you to mention a type which is core, which is just a physical network where you would mention the physical uh, properties of your material, the thermal resistance and thermal capacitance, or there is a way for you to mention the Foster values, which are uh, based on the time constants, essentially. Okay, so now that we've added the losses, I click OK. So we've added the losses to it, and then let me enter the external gate resistance as 2.5 ohms. This is for this particular MOSFET. And the initial temperature is the same as the um, ambient temperature, which is 25. And I need to mention the initial temperature for 
the heat sink as well. You could mention the thermal capacitance here or not. It's up to you. Let me just make it as zero or one. Okay. Um, now, if I run the circuit, I should be able to see the inductor current, the output voltage, and the value of the temperature. So I drag and drop the heat sink into the probe and select the component signal as the temperature. And I go to simulation and start. We are seeing now the temperature is rising. OK. Um, so we, what we're seeing here is the temperature is not yet reached its steady state value because the uh, time constant of the temperature is like lower than the output value or the inductor value. What we can do here is use the steady state analysis tool. Um, and start analysis which would give the final temperature here as in, in between 27 to 27.5. Now let's continue uh, with this model. So what we have here is an electrical circuit. We have added a thermal, uh, thermal component on top of the MOSFET. Now what we can do also is we could add a heat sink on top of the resistor. For example, uh, if it's a power resistor, and then you can have uh, it's housing and heat sink and all that here. But then let's move along and continue with the magnetic domain. So these are the magnetic domain components. So let's build this inductor which is in the electrical domain in magnetic domain. So I hold shift and I move this out of my system or out of my circuit. And I drag and drop the winding component. So the winding component is the one that links the electrical world or the electrical domain to the magnetic domain. This is similar to the heat sink, which was linking the electrical domain to the thermal domain. So we have uh, now connected the winding. If I double click on the winding component, you see there is a way to mention the number of turns and the polarity, but then here you don't see the inductance uh, tab. That's because we are not now dealing with inductances anymore. We are now dealing with the physical properties, the geometric uh, properties of the core itself. So there are three cores here. There is a linear core, there is a saturable core, and there is a hysteric core. So the linear core is fully linear in the sense that it is um, there is no saturation, there is no BH curve inside. It is just a linear part of the BH curve. What you need to specify here are the geometrical uh, or the physical properties of the core material, which are the cross-sectional area, the length of the flux path, and then the relative permeability. So what you're seeing here, it is a very geometric approach to model your magnetics. And there is a saturable core where you you also need to specify a fitting function and the perme sorry the permeability of uh, the core before the saturation and after the saturation. You can read more about it in the help section and then where you see the fitting curves here and these are the uh, the cot H and the ATAN fitting functions. And there's also a hysteric core component which implements, this implements the most detailed behavior because it goes through the major loops and the minor loops and whenever a loop is closed, this component dissipates an energy packet. But this also takes most of the time for calculation because now this is very um, detailed and this is a lossy component. So now no, no, let's delete these two and use a saturable core here for our calculation. Um, connect the terminals. Okay. So um, I got, let me go to the, uh, 
I got a magnetics data sheet here which I got from magnetics online so we're gonna model this particular uh, toroidal core as an inductor so the values that I need are the cross-sectional area here and the length of the flux path here and then this um, yeah that's it yeah and then this AL value right here so I have under simulation simulation parameters and initialization I have already put these values which I got from the data sheet which are these are the cross-sectional area this is the length of the flux path and then mu naught is the permeability of free space and this is AL value which is uh, nano Henry per turn square from which I got the relative uh, permeability value and n is the number of turns so I'm using an inductor of 1 milli Henry so if I plug in those values here so this number of turns is n now and I'm using a fitting function of a tan and the cross-sectional area is a e um, length of flux path is l e and the relative permeability is u r and the saturated relative permeability I'm considering it to be one because this is the ratio of the saturated value of the permeability uh, to the value of the permeability in air so I'm just considering it to be one and 0.5 is the flux density for this ion core and I click apply um, and when I hit run now you're now seeing the values of the output voltage and the inductor current as previously but the inductor current values here are from the magnetic core or the magnetic domain not the electrical domain anymore again it takes a while for the temperature uh, of the heat sink to get into steady state so what we can do is we can go to simulation analysis tools and start a steady state analysis but before that we should stop this I start a steady state analysis and here is what you see when you read steady state so this is the inductor current values which is different from what you got um, when you were using the electrical inductor so this is all about the thermal and magnetic uh, now Nicholas will continue with the mechanical domain and then we'll answer all your questions okay everybody so let's continue now with the mechanical domain So again, um, for this special mechanical domain, we uh, aim, of course, to solve a few modeling problems that might occur in your, um, in your system level analysis. And for mechanical systems, um, this is typically about a very complex mechanical load. Um, so you can see here, we have an electrical drive system and uh, a quite complex mechanical load that we will have a look um, at in detail later. And both are basically coupled via this electrical machine or the uh, back EMF of the electrical machine in, um, yeah, very specific. So we are again aiming for a seamless integration of this mechanical domain so that we just have one schematic and one simulation in plex so not a co-simulation but really a tightly integrated um, simulation of this mechanical domain and therefore we again need to find an analogy between the different mechanical quantities and the electrical quantities now you all might be familiar with uh, Newton's uh, law where you have basically a second-order derivative of the position coordinate times the mass of a body or the inertia of a body uh, equal to the applied force or um, in the rotational domain uh, the applied torque so for the sake of simplicity, here we're just uh, looking at the rotational, one-dimensional rotational domain in plex, even though you have the same possibilities um, for the translational domain plex um, considering modeling. So instead of using the second order differential equation, in plex we use a first, first order differential equation and the um, rotational speed omega here as a state variable. So the uh, state 
equation for an inertia um, is as follows. So we have the derivative of omega uh, is equal to the applied torque, um, the sum of all uh, torques basically divided by the inertia j. And this very much resembles a equation or state equation of an electrical capacitor so that we could basically find now the analogy that we say that the electrical rotation, uh, sorry, the mechanical rotational speed is analogous to the voltage in the elect electrical domain, J, the inertia um, equivalent or analog to the um, electrical capacitance and the torque uh, analogous to the uh, electrical current. So this is summarized here on the on the right. We would have all these um, analogies also for the different components. Now important because we are just using a first order differential equation is that at some point we also need to calculate you know the um, the relative angle uh, relative to a certain reference frame just by integrating the uh, rotational speed. So at this point, there is no clear uh, benefit why to use um, the mechanical domain in Plex, but we have actually uh, quite special components in our library, which very much uh, distinguishes us or Plex from other simulation tools. And these are very nonlinear elements. And one of these is the uh, stick, slip, uh, stick slip friction component. And uh, what we have here is basically a stick slip motion of two flanges connected to each other. Important is here that um, this component is implemented in an idealized way, which means that for zero speed, we have basically a continuous set of torque values available. So from zero to a certain breakaway torque when we are in a sticking state. And once this breakaway torque is reached, we go to a, a Coulomb torque here, and then we have a linear relationship uh, between the torque and the speed. So instead of having to solve basically very stiff differential equations, we are able to handle this uh, motion in an idealized fashion. And we can then basically reduce this um, computationally very expensive um, um, you know, process to this state machine that's given here on the right. So we have this uh, state machine describing this quite complex physical process. Now, another uh, nice nonlinear component that we have in the library is the gear backlash or the hard stop. And what this means is that, um, or these components represent the fact that torque is only transmitted in a certain angular window. So when you consider these two gears, then only if basically one um, uh, extreme point of the angle um, is hit, then, or basically when they are in contact, these two gears, then only torque is transmitted between the two um, bodies. And this can be represented in Plex with a uh, backlash component. And if you use a hard stop component, then um, you can represent, for example, uh, when a, a body um, in the translational domain hits a wall, um, you could also then represent um, uh, this, this, uh, this process. So once, um, Basically, you hit either the theta min or theta max value. Uh, you have the two bodies um, connected in a rigid way, so they're basically um, ideally interconnected. So last but not least, we have um, the nonlinear component of the clutch. And this is a, a very interesting component because here we can model inelastic uh, collisions between uh, in this case, two inertias. Uh, we have one inertia here on the left that's rotating with uh, one rods per second, and on the right we have it uh, spinning, uh, or resting actually, spinning with zero speed. And what happens if we engage the clutch and let the two um, basically collide in an idealized uh, way? So um, for this slide, I've prepared a, a little demo in Plex to show how this is modeled.
a little bit bigger. So again, this is the exact um, picture where we had on the slide before. We have these two inertia spinning with different speeds. And then when we look under the mask, we have basically um, the clutch connecting the two together. Now when we do the simulation, you see the following, that for this inelastic collision, Plex has to take into account the conservation of angular momentum, so that um, after we have connected two inertias, we have actually uh, a smaller uh, mechanical energy of the system, and uh, of course the two bodies now spin with the same speed of 0 0.5. So that's basically the ideal clutch. Um, now, I said before, we have all these possibilities of modeling, um, you know, inertia, springs, dampers, and so on by using these analogies to the electrical system. And we can do this also for this um, inelastic collision. So we could say this is a non-ideal uh, inelastic collision by adding basically elasticities, damping uh, elements, and so on that should make, you know, a more detailed model of the collision. So let's use this. Instead, we use a uh, damped clutch with non-ideal shaft and rerun the simulation. So very nice, um, as you can be seen here, we again have, in general, the same process. So we have basically a dropping of the mechanical energy and we have um, basically the same uh, final speed of the two inertias, but the process of connecting the two bodies is non-ideal and might be related to some oscillations. So that's the non-ideal clutch. All right, so um, basically that already summarizes um, the uh, mechanical domain in Plex. Now, because we cannot really extend the buck converter example with a mechanical domain um, in, a, in a way that would make, uh, you know, very much sense. I would like to actually show you one of our demo models uh, from the Plex demo model library. And um, if you have a Plex open now, you can go to uh, Window Demo Models and search once for Server Drive. So on the top right corner, you can say Open this model. And here we have it. So this was basically the picture we saw at the very beginning. Um, we had um, this electrical drive system here, the electrical machine, and the complex mechanical load. Now what's happening here is that we would like to move this um, translational mass here to a certain position. And this is done by using this uh, control scheme here. Uh, we are basically regulating um, the currents or basically regulating over the gating signals of this IGPT bridge here, um, the currents, and then this way we'd like to position this body in, um, yeah, to, to, a certain, to a certain position in space. Now we can run a simulation. And what is interesting here is that we now can make use of this nonlinear component in the Plex mechanical domain. So what we see uh, very nicely here on the bottom graph is in red, we have the position of the mass. And as you see, it um, moves up to a certain point, but it basically exceeds the set point that we want to achieve at the very end. And it hits basically an upper limit of this blue line. So this blue line is uh, represented by a hard stop component um, that has a certain upper limit where we cannot go uh, uh, over. All right, so this allows us now to model the situation where we hit this wall uh, ideally, and it also gives us now the opportunity to, of course, implement a more or a better controller um, that do, does not overshoot this uh, set point by, by that much. And this is done here in this demo model by choosing another um, steam li speed limit configuration. So this is what was a fixed speed limit, and now we could choose an optimum speed limit and compare basically the two in simulation. So this is um, basically a standard control. Now if you rerun the simulation, clicking simulation and start, 
we can directly compare the two simulation results. So before we had basically this result and now uh, with the optimum speed control, we have um, a very nice approach of the um, supposed or of the set position without any overshoot. Okay, so this um, basically concludes the Plex mechanical domain. Um, maybe just very quickly as a reminder of what we saw today are these different um, modeling domains. So this was a very quick glance at these uh, physical domains, of course. Um, and we found uh, the following analogy. So we started with the electrical system where we have, of course, voltage and current as our state variables. We then went to the uh, thermal system where we identified temperature and heat flow as the analogous quantities. Um, magnetic, we had magnetomotive force and um, flux rate. And after that, we went to the mechanical domain using the translational and rotational domains uh, where we identified basically speed and torque as the corresponding state variables. Now, since these are all uh, analogies, that was the reason why we were able to integrate them so seamlessly in our um, schematic and have basically one simulation capturing all uh, different uh, physical domains and also the interactions, of course, without having to do a, um, a co-simulation. So, as I said, it probably doesn't add that much value at this point, but what we added in our library, which is very, very interesting, is our special components in each of these um, physical domains. So, for the thermal, or let's say starting with the electrical, um, we have, of course, our ideal switch concept. For the thermal um, simulation, we have um, basically this uh, way of uh, calculating the switching losses based on lookup table approach and the heatsink concept. When we go to the magnetic domain, we would have uh, the importance of leakage flux path and uh, non-linearities such as um, saturation and hysteretic behavior. And when it comes to the mechanical domain, again, we would focus very much on non linear elements such as, as um, gear backlash, hard stop, or the clutch. Okay, so this was um, this introduction to the Plex physical domains. Of course, this was only a very quick introduction, um, basically just showing you these analogies. And we, of course, would like to invite you to um, try further um, and, and work uh, work on your own models using these physical domains. So if you don't have a um, Plex trial license or not a current one, you might want to go on our website, uh, plexon.com and apply for a trial license. Also, um, regarding any open questions that um, you might have now after this session, or even if you have asked them during the session, we will definitely get back to you via email. Um, also, really feel free to um, give us any feedback regarding this uh, webinar. And, um, of course, uh, feel free to ask any questions about these different domains. I think we now would have uh, time to answer some questions. and. Okay, so we have um, basically two questions here um, just coming in. So one is um, the question about how to model a coupling and mutual inductance in multi-winding um, transformers. So I think uh, what uh, my colleague um, Manu was um, showing before is a very nice example on how to do that. And um, the nice thing, if you look at the Plex um, magnetic domain, is that you actually do not have to place any mutual inductance uh, elements anymore. But you will do this by just really representing the magnetic flux path. Um, so we can actually open again this, this demo model. So if you go to demo models and then go to power generation and open the double fed induction generator for a wind turbine and open here this, um, this transformer by doing a right click and then look under mask. You can basically um, do any 
magnetic flux path that you wish. So now these are the main ones um, for the core, but of course you could um, think about, you know, connecting any of these points here um, if you want to consider, for example, a different cross coupling. So instead of having this electrical equivalent circuit where you would have to probably derive the equations and then figure out how to um, do the cross coupling, you could then use the plex mechanical as uh, a magnetic domain to represent directly the magnetic flux path between any of these branches here. Okay, so there was uh, somebody asking about the analogy between the um, inertia and um, the capacitor in the electrical system. So uh, first I would like to mention that you can implement these analogies um, the way you want. Now in Plex we did it um, in such a way that, let me open that slide maybe again, that we really use these uh, analogies here. So uh, as you can see here, if you have uh, the voltage here identified as the speed, then this really uh, much resembles um, the equation of an electrical capacitor. You have the possibility, and I'm not sure, I think there might be other simulation programs using a different analogy to actually choose the speed as uh, an analogy to a uh, current, electrical current. So then the inertia would then represent an inductor. But that's not what we do in Plex. Um, uh, we use another analogy, but uh, as I think I remember from other simulation programs, you're actually free to choose uh, which states you find analogous to, um, to the other ones. Now, because they, they don't relate in any way in the mechanical you know, sense. I mean, these are completely uh, unrelated. It's just really that you try to set up an equation and you try to find, you know, an analogous equation in the electrical domain and identify some, um, some uh, uh, characteristics or, uh, yeah, state variables in the end. There was another question. Um, about the variable inertia for mechanical loads. Um, this is a good question. So when you look at our library uh, in Plex, you do see for the mechanical domain that there are no variable masses uh, or no variable inertias. Sorry, this is the wrong one. Translational or rotational one. So components. Um, so this is uh, basically just a, a basic set, but you can always add a variable mass or a variable inertia by just using a um, basically a speed source, rotational speed controlled. So as we said in this slide before, we use uh, the speed uh, in analogy to the, to the voltage um, or the angular speed analogy to the voltage. And the only thing we need to do now is to uh, basically re-implement the state equation and feed in here the speeds that we calculate from the state equation. So this is not done by default um, because I think there is also no default way this variable um, inertia could work in a me mechanical system. Of course, we're always happy if you have some, you know, very global descriptions of these components. Um, but yeah, that would be the general way to set it up. So you would um, basically create here the term uh, to integrate. Then you would use an integrator and connect it to the speed source. And this component in total would then uh, basically be your variable inertia. So yeah, that, that could be uh, one possible way to implement it. Um, if you have uh, any detailed question about that, please uh, get in contact uh, with us via email and we are happy to help you in this uh, modeling, in this modeling, uh, task. Okay, let me see if there are other questions. Oh, 
Okay, so there is another question about the thermal domain, and this um, is regarding uh, soft switching behavior. Now, um, as my colleague Manu pointed out, we are using an ideal switch approach where you cannot um, you cannot uh, capture basically the, the switching transient between a blocking state and a conducting state of the switch. So um, basically already there, the modeling, I would say, for soft switching behavior is, uh, is probably insufficient. Now, what you can do is, if you have information about the soft switching behavior, you can adapt the loss tables um, to basically take into account the soft switching behavior. But I would say from us, out of the box, there is no, or no out of the box solution provided to capture soft switching losses in, uh, in converters. So I would say um, its main application is um, to hard switched converters. If you have any, again, uh, any special topologies that you have in mind, um, you can uh, contact us and we can see if we can figure out uh, an easy way also, to, also for um, incorporation of, let's say, zero voltage or zero current switching applications. Someone here has a question about the state machine tool. So the state machine uh, block has been upgraded um, in the current 4.1 version of Plex. So if you go to window and you go to demo models, we have new demo models on the state machine, um, which are, which is the buck converter with constant on time state machine uh, demo model, and also the direct flux vector control. No, not this one, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, so this uh, this demo model uh, shows the state machine uh, block, but if you also search for state machine, we have we have uh, further information about uh, how to work with uh, state machines and several examples of that here. And apart from the state machine, we also have the C script and the DLL blocks. If someone is interested. Okay, so if there are no other questions, um, we would like to thank you again for attending this uh, webinar. Um, please let us know any feedback you have regarding the webinar. Um, if you would like to see some topics also covered in the future that you might be, uh, think might be interesting for you. Um, also, if you have any other questions you that might come up now after the session, please feel free to um, send an email to us and we get in touch, to, uh, touch with you. Okay, so thanks again very much and we will uh, close the session now.